If I could first uh, ask Jerry, I'm just interested in your timeline here, your statement that sounded like you were uh, aiming for a quick turn on this. Uh, generally, do you have an ideal timeline? And, and if I could ask Greg something real quick after uh, Mr. Moorhead answers. Right. I haven't established a, a firm timeline, uh, but I obviously uh, want this to move along uh, expeditiously. I don't want this to drag out for, uh, you know, months and months and months into the future. Uh, but we need to have a sufficient enough timeline to make sure that the advisory committee is able to advise me on all of the uh, significant candidates uh, that uh, have an interest in the job. And Greg, making sure I'm clear, it sounds like that you were leaning pretty hard in this direction before COVID hit and, and, and maybe stayed on because of COVID. So I understand that you, you might have retired at the end of the fiscal year had COVID not hit first. And secondly, are, is there one or two things out there that, have, that you really want to get around to doing in retirement? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, I'll answer the, the last part of that first. There's nothing to, you know, from a retirement standpoint. I, again, I haven't really thought about those things, Chip, moving forward. You know, we'll just let let things uh, be dictated as they develop and everything. But, uh, you know, I mean, I remember the president and I were together in Nashville at the SEC basketball tournament, uh, as many of you were. And, um, you know, timing's everything in life. And it, that just wasn't the right time uh, during that time. So, uh, you know, now's the right time. But again, I, I appreciate everything the president's done. And, you know, it's, uh, we've, we've had a lot of a lot of discussions on this and uh, I appreciate his desire to to want me to stay on and everything but it's just time now but uh, certainly COVID stepped in and uh, kind of you know messed up a lot of people with their plans and everything but everything always turns out for the the right reason and and that's where we are today. If I could add something to to what Greg has said uh, yeah. Chip I really think it's been uh, extremely important to have had Greg in this role uh, since COVID hit in March. And I think if you talk to Greg Sankey, uh, our SEC commissioner, he would say the same thing because having uh, individuals like Mitch Barnhart at Kentucky and Greg McGarrity at Georgia, uh, seasoned athletic directors uh, in the room uh, on a lot of these calls uh, with and without presidents as we had to make a number of difficult decisions and figuring out how we restart uh, athletics and how we restart it and when we restart it. Uh, it was important to have Greg. And then it was important, uh, I think, for our own athletic department to have him uh, as we had to implement the plan that the uh, NCAA and the SEC uh, authorized us uh, to move forward on. So, yes, I'd love to have had Greg stay longer, but it was really important to have him uh, during uh, this uh, significant part of the pandemic. And we can all hope uh, that we'll see a vaccine in the near future that begins to get distributed and that we begin in the coming months uh, to turn the corner on this pandemic. But it's been a challenge uh, for me at the university level, and I know it's been a challenge for Greg, certainly been a challenge for our commissioner. But I, I think having uh, some seasoned uh, individuals has, has helped a lot. Thank you. I think we're back well, to Mike Griffith. Thank, thanks, Claude. Greg, I know you've done a lot over the last 10 years. I know you don't have a list in front of you, but it, could, you, could you reflect on some of the key, I don't know if contributions or movements or decisions? I mean, obviously, George is in a, in a very advantageous place, all things considered right now. When you look back, and it's time to do that, Greg, don't, don't dodge the question. Uh, what are some of the things that, that you're proud of um, that you've accomplished over the last 10 years? You know, Mike, it's interesting that you bring that up because, uh, you know, I was thinking about the top three or four moments. Uh, you know, I think back to the concert in Sanford Stadium back in 2013. Uh, I think it's the, the first time and maybe the only time everyone will leave Sanford Stadium happy. 
but that night, that environment was just magical and, um, you know, it's just a rewarding experience. But the top three uh, uh, had to be, in my mind, uh, Notre Dame in 17, uh, going to Chicago. I remember the president and I, we, we were together and we were in Chicago Thursday night. We rode to uh, South Bend on Friday, had a tour of the stadium, a nice lunch, uh, and then went up to um, our hotel up in, I think it was right on the uh, Lake Erie, uh, one of the Great Lakes. And, uh, and that game was just remarkable. Um, and then to be followed by the Rose Bowl, I, th I think that was just something that was just monumental the whole week. It was like fantasy land. And to win the game and advance to Atlanta and to be in the Rose Bowl winning that game. But, you know, the, the best was Notre Dame last year in my mind. Uh, Kevin Butler and I were texting earlier about that experience because he and I were standing together <clears throat> in the west end zone on the field. And you had the national anthem going, you had the flyover, you had just a beautiful weather, you had the new lights. You know, that, that day was so magical. I think all of us that were there knew that this, uh, everything came together in a perfect way. And it was one of those times to where you just kind of shake your head and say, you know, we, we need to remember this because it was, as I told Kevin, it's probably the most emotional I've ever been be on the field during the anthem and see it all unfold. But, you know, those are the, those are the, uh, the big stage moments that I'll remember, but th there's so many others, Mike. I mean, just being able to work alongside great people and see what's happened recently with facilities and the way our donors have responded uh, financially to, to really pay for everything uh, has been really rewarding. But uh, there's so many things we could take up the whole call with this. But those are those are a few of the highlights. Thank you, Greg. Let's go to Dean Leggy with Dog Post, and then Jake Rowe with uh, Two Four Seven Sports. Jerry, I want to ask you, um, what kind of pressure do you get at your uh, from from boosters or from uh, boosters is probably the wrong word, uh, Georgia partisans about success in athletics, and how complicated is it to? Uh, uh, deal with that in a fundraising capacity for the university? How important are athletics to the uh, trajectory of fundraising at the university? I hear about it a lot. Uh, and, you know, sometimes uh, the, uh, the, the criticisms are justified and make sense. Uh, sometimes uh, they come from a perspective of people not having the knowledge uh, or the background that uh, Gregor or I may have on the issue. Uh, and, and to me, that's one of the things I'm really going to miss uh, when Greg leaves. He probably won't miss it, but it's having to deal with text messages from me at 11 p.m. Uh, or, uh, or, or calls uh, even on holidays when somebody is upset about something. And uh, he's always been calm and steady and, and had the right information to give me uh, that's allowed me to uh, explain and navigate uh, uh, some of these uh, concerns that you hear from time to time. But clearly, I think uh, when people are happy about the success of our athletic program, uh, it tends to have a positive impact on uh, the feelings that they have for the University of Georgia and therefore the support that they provide to the University of Georgia. I don't think it's inextricably linked. Uh, I think we have a lot of donors that give to the university because they love the university. And we have some donors that give to athletics solely because they care about athletics. But I think most people care about both and they really like it when they see Georgia ranked in the top 15 of, of the best public research universities in America and then they see our, our football team uh, ranked very high in the national polls as well. I think there's a certain pride level and it makes my job easier uh, certainly when we're able to be out and and to have the sort of donor events that uh, we've had many of over the last several years. Greg, I uh, wanted to ask you, 
obviously this this your position can be kind of a thankless position and and it's uh in its nature but uh if you could write your own legacy if you could just if you could be the guy that just put it out there for now to the end of time what what would that be what would you want your time at georgia to be characterized as oh jake uh just to make this place a little bit better uh, we all understand we're just temporary holders of these positions. And, uh, you know, when I entered back in the summer of 10, you know, things were kind of messy. And it took a long time to uh, work with staff and try to reestablish some uh, relationships and try to uh, get things back on track for, from an administrative level. And that took some time and effort. Uh, but, you know, I mean, Others are right what they want. I, I really haven't reflected much on that much, Jake, other than just saying that, you know, you wanted to come in every day, give it your best shot and do the best you could and let the chips fall where they may. But if you can leave and just say you made it just a little bit better, I think that's, uh, that would be all I would, all I would uh, want on my, uh, I guess, summary of my performance. Well, I would add one important thing, which was uh, fiscal responsibility. Uh, I think uh, Greg over the years uh, took some criticism uh, for uh, the fact that we had a reserves. And some of you may remember the presentations that Ryan Nesbitt, our treasurer made about the importance of a 501c3 having uh, reserves for a rainy day. Uh, well, it's been pouring the last eight or nine months, and uh, having those reserves has put us in a much better position than many other major athletic programs in the country uh, that chose to go deeply in debt and not to have anything in reserve. So I appreciate uh, the fiscal responsibility that uh, Greg provided to the Athletic Association, along with many other things, of course. Hey, let's go to Augusta Stone with the red and black, and then Brandon Sudge with the Macon Telegraph. Greg, I want to know what's been the most challenging part of leading the Athletic Association through the COVID-19 pandemic in your last few months here? And then along that line, what's a positive aspect you've been able to take from the difficulties of the year? Well, Augusta, I think the toughest part is, you know, athletics is all about teamwork and togetherness and huddles and locker rooms and you know, we just haven't been able to experience that. Uh, that's been the most difficult thing because, uh, I mean, the president and I aren't traveling this year uh, because we're not technically essential and in the bubble. Uh, and so those are the difficult things. I mean, I remember the president and I were texting each other on the first road game. It was like, you know, we've never experienced that before. So we've had to learn how to adjust and so has everyone else. I mean, you've had to adjust, our students have had to adjust, our faculty, and being able to pivot as quickly as the university has done is really a, a great story to tell. But everybody's had to adjust, and I, I think it's made it very difficult. I think the positive part of it is made us realize uh, that we should be very grateful and thankful for things we probably took for granted. Uh, maybe waiting in line at the concession stand or at a restroom uh, or maybe being a little in a parking jam. You know, we would cherish those things right now or go to a tailgate. Um, so I think the positive thing is, is when we do get back to normal that I think people hopefully will be more understanding, will be more patient. You know, I know that's a wish. I don't know if that'll come true, but I just hope people will sit back and realize and look back on their time here and realize that the things we probably took for granted um, just are not taken for granted anymore. And we'll appreciate those experiences there. But the only way we could really do that is experience what we're going through right now, which nobody loves. And so I'm hoping that'll be the positive out of this and that, that uh, athletics in general may be a little bit more uh, quiet so to speak in the the world of social media and these things and again i'm i'm that's hopeful thinking i'm not so sure that'll happen but uh i'm just hoping that will lead into maybe a different different perspective on things thanks for the thank question you. of course thank you hey uh greg so i wanted to ask you about uh josh and uh 
Darice. Um, so when you hired them in those roles, what did you see from them? What do you feel like they can do in the center room uh, position? And then also when you promoted uh, Josh in January, did you do that with via retirement uh, in your head, like in mind? Well, you know, we had to we had to get Josh back twice. I remember <clears throat> at one time he was actually in Dallas, Texas, uh, uh, fixing to accept a job with, with Jimbo Fisher at FSU. So we had to call him back and get him back in the fold. And and then when he went off to uh, be the athletic director at Millsaps and later at ULM, uh, you know, we got him back again because we knew that he was a, a vital part of our program. And, you know, when he wasn't here, we really missed his enthusiasm. And he was kind of like a, <clears throat> a Pied Piper. He had a lot of followers. You know, great leaders have a lot of followers. And he was able to cultivate a large group of, of student workers and others that just enjoyed being around him. So his his personality was contagious. And we really missed that. And uh, he's brought that back to our program and is very popular among the staff. And he's just, he just wired the right way. Uh, and the same with Darice. Um, I tell you folks, she is a superstar on the rise. Uh, Darice is so valuable to us. And, you know, having served at Florida in a, in a backup role, you realize how important those people are to your program to, to make the athletic direct, director's job a bit easier. And Darice is just absolutely phenomenal. And I'm so glad the president uh, did what he did on the interim basis because uh, that's a great one-two punch, okay? Uh, but, you know, Josh had ascended to that role. Uh, I felt like it was important for him to, to receive that, that kind of recognition and kind of acknowledgement that he was, uh, you know, the number two person here. And, you know, um, you know, the title goes along with that, but his responsibilities grew and he represented me when I wasn't able to be at athletic directors meetings or things of that nature. So, you know, very much like Jeremy Foley did for me at the University of Florida, I wasn't in the chair, but I was pretty close to it. So I was able to experience a lot of things that uh, I would not have experienced unless somebody had been a great mentor to me. And that's all I wanted to do really to all our staff is just mentor them and help them achieve their dreams. And what could I do to, to help them out? Hey, we're going to ask uh, Greg to stick around just for a couple more questions. We're going to excuse president Moorhead who has uh, some other appointments before the president steps away though. I have one question for Greg, the book on the windowsill behind your desk there. What I can't read the whole title. Would you read that? What is the title of that book? Okay, Claude, you're setting me up here. It's the Norton Anthology of Poetry, okay? <laughs> I, I have it up there. I, I brought it out because I think it's kind of interesting to have, but Claude and I were looking at it, and as I opened it, and I very rarely open it, in all honesty, okay, <clears throat> I found out my schedule at the University of Georgia in 1973, the spring quarter. We were on quarters back then, and I had three exams on the same day, and I was making an appeal to my uh, advisor, George Abney, back in the J school back then. So I just thought I'd have a little fun with the Norton Ooh. Anthology of Poetry back there, okay? <laughs> well, George Abney was an iconic figure at the University of Georgia. <laughs> and I'm man, I'll tell you that. Uh, President Moorhead, thanks so much for your time. Thank morning. you, and uh, I appreciate it. Sorry, I'm going to go see a donor right now that's on campus, but thank you all. Thanks, President. All right, let's, uh, we'll take a couple more questions for Greg here. Let's, let's go to maybe Zach Klein at uh, WSB and then David Paschal at Chattanooga Times Free Press. Hey, Greg, considering this is obviously one of the elite jobs in college athletics, and there's no doubt the next man or woman who takes that chair will be ultra qualified. And I know you're going to tell me they don't need your advice, but if he or she were to reach out to you for one thing you've learned along the way in that chair at that school, what would it be for them? Well, two things really, Zach. One is to uh, treat others with respect and dignity. Uh, acknowledge and appreciate those from your custodial staff to, you know, your highest paid employees. Uh, and just be kind of a regular person. Be yourself. Um, but probably more important is just exercise patience. You know, when I first got here, I, I wasn't the most patient person in the world. And I wanted to micromanage and 
I did some self evaluations with our staff and those came back as, you know, you need to relax a little bit. And, and so I learned from my staff because I, will, I wasn't afraid to find out what I needed to learn and listen. So I would just say, uh, first and foremost, be, be, be nice to people. Uh, you don't have to say yes to everything, but when you say no, it's how you say no. Uh, but I think patience is something that's really missing in college athletics now as we're seeing across college football now. And before you make a decision, you have to be 100% certain that it's not gonna work. And we're not perfect. You know, no one's ever batted a thousand in the hiring process, but I will say this, I was talking to the president about it earlier that even for those head coaches that we've parted ways with, they're quality people. I mean, you, you go down the list and there's not one coach we've had here that you would say is a bad person or did things the wrong way. And I'm, uh, one thing we should be proud of is that we've had great people that have represented Georgia in the right way. And we've been so fortunate there, but um, patience is probably uh, in short demand right now, but it, it needs to be uh, a strength of a program. Greg, a legacy and non-legacy question, if I could. Um, your legacy will always include the decision you made late in 2015 with, with Mark and Kirby. Uh, it's not every AD that makes a decision to remove a coach who was winning, I guess, 10 games a year for the last five years, and we know how it's played out with the three straight SECs. But personally for you, how, how difficult and trying were those days? Oh, God. The, you know, they, those are the worst parts of our job because you know it not only affects one person, it's a whole uh, uh, network of people. And, you know, I remember sitting in this office right here and Mark was sitting right behind me. Carla was with me and it's eight o'clock on a Sunday morning. You know, hell, I, I took it. I mean, I was, I was very emotional. I had a hard time, you know, talking about Mark. I'm sitting across from someone that is, is without question, maybe the greatest person you'll ever come up, uh, you'll ever meet. I mean, uh, a person that was selfless, that his story, uh, the adoption of his children, I mean, my gosh, I mean, that's, it's so difficult. And I really struggle with that. And it wasn't easy to do, but that's the tough thing about being in leadership positions. You Sometimes it's not the best thing for individuals. You have to do what's best for the institution. And at that time, I thought it was the best thing for us. and. Uh, but those are the very difficult things, and there, it's no fun doing that. Trust me, you don't sleep the night before, and you just you dread it. Uh, but I just thought that things had to had to change, and you know, the jury will be out for forever on those type things, David. But uh, you know, that's sort of the way things kind of uh, happen during those those periods of time. And the other I wanted to ask about was just men's basketball. I know it is yep. a challenge, and you've made the change there, and. I get, it's kind of a historical head scratcher when you consider Atlanta and the talent right there. And, and I know y'all have had more success than Georgia Tech. I'm not bringing them into it, but I mean, it is just, you know, what is your thoughts on men's basketball and, and how that's been the last decade? You know, David, we've, we've been to the NCAA and since my tenure, we've been to the NCAA tournament twice and we're 0, 0 and 2. Um, and you know, I just think that Georgia needs, you may not be in it every year, but you need to certainly be in the discussion about that. And that's never been a consistent part of Georgia basketball ever. I mean, Coach Durham was awesome, but we consistently weren't really uh, a top flight team. Uh, and we've had periods of greatness, or well, not greatness. I mean, periods of, of really good teams, but it was almost like a yo-yo. You were up one year and down the next. And, and I just felt like that Georgia hopefully could be consistent in that manner. Um, and I remember Coach Fox, when I came in, you know, he had told me that, you know, he had a long, long runway. And uh, I know President Adams at that time had a long runway with Mark because he had to turn the program around. That was, you know, nine or 10 years. Um, but after that time, we cert certain reached certain points and, I just felt like we weren't uh, uh, getting there uh, and it was time for a change. And I just think it's so difficult, Dave, when you're trying to do – it's kind of like Tom Black in volleyball. Uh, you go down the hallway at, at the uh, 
at the Ramsey Center and you walk down the right side of the hallway and you're seeing Jack Bowerly with Olympic champions and gold medals and everything 30, 40 years here and you go down the other side, I have really nothing in volleyball. And what Tom Black has done is absolutely remarkable here, especially having a good fall. And, you know, I think Tom, Tom is just going to be remarkable. And we need Tom Black to stay at the University of Georgia. But um, I think some sports is so much more difficult when there's, there's nothing to really fall back on as far as historic, historically. And I think that's a challenge in basketball. It takes time. Uh, and, and Mark was given a long runway, and you know, I feel the same way with Tom. It takes time to, to really establish a foothold and to, to make things work. And so, you know, I've, I've, I mean, if you watched our second half, I know um, it was just our first game, but you saw a different team the first half and second half uh, Sunday afternoon. So I, I think, you know, I think things will turn out perfectly fine in, in basketball. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Let's go to Vance Levy with Bulldog Illustrated and then uh, Roddy Nabolsi, UGASports.com. Uh, Greg, first, congratulations on your retirement and thank you for your 10 years of a steady hand on the, on the, for the university. Uh, you basically have been in the business for 30 years. Uh, what, what changed the most in those 30 years? And what do you foresee being the biggest changes in the next 30 years? You know, Vance, I think the, uh, I think what's really hurt uh, our, not only our profession, but the lives of young people is the social media trend. Uh, Kirby mentioned it the other day at the presser about Demetrius Robinson, about, you know, the pressure that young people feel because it's, it's sort of an instant reaction to certain things. And, you know, people hide behind other names and, you know, back in the day, you used to pick up the phone or call someone or, or, or do things in a different way. And, you know, the accountability is just not there. And I think when you're seeing the lack of accountability and people aren't afraid to, say things on a, on a uh, uh, iPhone or things like that, you know, certainly I don't think they would say that on the street if they passed you on the street. So I think uh, the sad thing about it, so many young people are, are attached at the hip to these devices and there's so many bad things out there. Um, you know, growing up, thank goodness, when I was in college, we didn't have any of that, that stuff. And so I think that's probably been, uh, uh, harmful in some ways, even though it's the way of our society now, and that's how we kind of function now. But I just, I hate the uh, <clears throat> the negativity that's uh, in there. <clears throat> Vance, I think moving forward that, uh, you know, we've got to get out of this pandemic or there's going to be serious problems in college athletics. Um, um, and we're going to be okay this year, but if we go through another year of 20,000 people in Sanford Stadium, uh, and 1,600 people in Stegman, and 400 or so at Foley Field, you know, I, it's going to be hard to make ends meet. And so we're fortunate to be able to, to, to have the resources this year, but that's certainly not set up to do it multiple years. So I think the, the, uh, the concern there financially going down the road to support everything you're supporting is, is going to be really important and um, – you know, down the road, you know, who knows what the NCAA will look like. Um, and I just hope we all get through this pandemic sooner than later, because it certainly doesn't need to stretch into the fiscal year 22, or they're going to be uh, severe um, consequences to, to really everyone, much more than they are right now across the college space. Hey, Greg, uh, two quick questions for you. Uh, well, first, uh, congratulations on a great career. And uh, uh, speak on behalf of everybody. We really appreciate your availability whenever we had questions. Uh, the responsiveness has been fantastic. Uh, two things I'd like to get to uh, ask you. One, did the voluntary retirement incentive program have any uh, bearing on your decision? And two, if Josh Brooks were to ask you for a letter of recommendation, what would you write? Well, first, no, we're not eligible for the voluntary retirement. I sure wish that was in play, but since we don't receive state funds, uh, uh, we were not eligible for that. So it had nothing to do with my retirement. I wish it had, because I'm sure there might've been others that would have jumped on that in a heartbeat, but 
<clears throat> that had to do with reduction in state obligations to institutions, but since there are no state funds involved in athletics, it, it was uh, not applicable to athletics. Uh, Thank you. And, uh, and say, what's the thing about, what's the second hey, part? If, uh, if, Josh, if Josh Brooks were to come to you and say, look, I'd need a letter of recommendation to give to President Moorhead and the search committee, sure. uh, could you share with us some of the things you would write in that letter for him? Sure. Uh, you know, I think those of us that have come up through the profession in the, uh, I call it the, the grunt stage to where you're, you start by picking up trash and you're doing the little things and you see what it takes to, uh, to make an operation work. And if you've been in the trenches, uh, you have an appreciation for those that are in the trenches right now. Uh, so I think his uh, ability to see the big picture is, uh, is outstanding. Uh, I think those of you that have met Josh and have worked with him, you know he's really great to work with. Uh, he's very easy to get to know. Uh, you know, I've seen him in, in difficult situations to where he's had to handle uh, situations that might have been pretty complex there. Uh, but I think he, he handles those well. He's got a, he's very smart. He's very creative, as you all know. Um, I think he has a wonderful family. Uh, you know, Lily and the boys are, are, are dynamic. And uh, I see his always running around the tracks and having our son kind of grow up in a college environment. We know that kind of being inside the ropes is a perk that we all have, but he's honest as the day is long. He's a, uh, he's just a good person. People get along with him. He's not a big timer. He's not a helicopter supervisor. You know, he, he, he realizes that we're all in support roles here. And while we have to say no at certain times, you know, all, all our job is to make people better. You know, we're not in it for ourselves. You know, what can we do to help coaches and student athletes have a great experience and, and do our best to make our, our staff uh, feel supported and doing whatever we can do to make their dreams come true. But I think he's, uh, he's wired in that manner and uh, has tremendous respect among his peers. Okay, we got time. We're going to take two more quick questions. Uh, if you have one, let's uh, go to Jay Black, WSB Radio, and then uh, Connor Riley with uh, Dog Nation. Jay? Greg, anything you didn't accomplish that you really wanted to? Oh, I think there's also, there's always going to be things, Jay, that uh, didn't happen uh, that, uh, that you wish would be completed. I, you know, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I really hadn't thought about that. Uh, you know, sure, you'd like to have a few more rings and things of that nature, and uh, you realize how hard it is to win championships, whether it's an SEC or national championship, and to come so close so many uh, times across the board in all sports, you know, that's something you wish you could have had happen. But, you know, and, uh, you know, we can't, you know, I, one thing I always, uh, despised was the shoulda, coulda, and would have environment, you know, uh, should have had, you know, if only that ball had been fair, if only we had caught that, you know, at the end of the day, those things didn't happen. So why even go there? All it does is take up time and burn energy. So you've got to flush those, um, those situations uh, down the toilet and move on to the next. But, you know, sure, there's a lot of things that uh, were left undone, but, uh, you know, you just, there's not much you can do about those now other than learn from them and move forward. Hey, Greg, first, congratulations on your retirement. And second, Jerry Moorhead praised your sort of financial uh, responsibilities and how well you had done in that aspect. How difficult was it to sort of, at times, show restraint and keep the, the money flowing while also knowing you have to continue to build facilities and update them and upgrade them as well. You know, Connor, uh, that's, that's a great question because, you know, I, I was kind of uh, received a lot of criticism for maybe not doing certain things, but I think what gets lost in the discussion is a lot of times, you know, athletic directors want to accomplish what the head coaches want to accomplish. OK, and certain things are important to some coaches and some are not. So it's not the athletic director telling a coach what's going to happen. It's, it works the other way in my mind. Uh, it'd be like me going out to the golf course and telling Chris, hey, hey Chris, we're going to we're going to redo all the greens and sand traps out there. OK, because that's what I want to do. And 
Chris Hack would say, well, no, I'd rather spend it at the practice green. So I'd rather listen to coaches on articulate what do they want, what's important to them, and then we'll get it done. And, and I think that we could say on the record that that's happened uh, probably 99% of the time is we've been able to react to the vision that the coaches have for their program. So I think that kind of gets lost in the shuffle. It's not the athletic director making the decisions on, wh on what we do. It's basically getting with a coach, understanding what they need, why they need it, and then developing a financial structure to make it all work. And thank God the McGill Society is here because every facility, I mean, we're up to, I think, almost $64 million in gifts and pledges for this Butts Mirror edition here for an $80 million project. I mean, we're still generating significant donations. So to think that our donors paid for the uh, indoor building, the West End Zone, and they're gonna pay for this as well eventually, and not taking on any long-term debt is a, is a tremendous tribute to those members of the McGill Society, because otherwise you'd have to tell a coach, well, you know, we can't afford it now, or I have to raise ticket prices X amount to, to do this. But, um, you know, to get back to your question, Connor, is, is you, take, uh, you take the advice and the counsel from your head coach and what's important to them, and then it's our job to make that happen. And if, if things don't happen, then, you know, that's our problem and we deal with it. But we've been very fortunate to, to be good listeners and do what our coaches have asked us to do from a facility standpoint. And I'm, I'm really proud of, of that aspect of our program. And unfortunately, others think that you, know, you may should drain, you know, you've got all this money sitting there, why don't you spend it on X, Y, and Z? And, you know, it's just like you and I, it's like everyone else, you know, we're not going to dip into our savings unless we really have to do it. And so We've just been very fortunate, but I think that's something we all take a great amount of pride in is the amount of uh, construction we've been able to do over the last decade. Greg, thanks uh, for your time this morning. I know everybody appreciates it. And, okay. uh, you can go back to your poetry book now and finish that up. Okay. And thanks to everybody for uh, calling in on the Zoom this morning. You know, and if y'all need, you know, I'm always available. So just call me if you need me, okay? I'll be here, here the uh, rest of the month, okay? Y'all be well. Thanks, take everyone. Care. Thanks, Claude. Correct.